What do you fear more? Things changing or things not changing? I woke up every night at 3 a.m. Every day I could feel my heartbeat pounding in my chest. I couldn't focus for more than a few minutes every single day. I felt so alone, and I felt I didn't know who to ask for help. The fear of failing my daughters felt suffocating, and I had no idea what was going on, either in my brain or in my body. Uncertainty. Uncertainty affects our brain and our body. Uncertainty drives anxiety, overwhelm, burnout, as Sam was about to find out. But wait a minute, aren't I supposed to be like the motivational speaker guy who like, helps other people <laughs> overcome their fears? Sure, but when uncertainty descends, no one's immune. I mean, look at us all. Over there, you're, you're worried about your, your, your energy bills. So am I. And, and I'm so sorry that, that you're concerned about a loved one. And I mean, if I'm really honest, I'm standing here right now, highly worried that I have the worst period pain of my life in the middle of a TEDx talk, and how am I going to get through it? And you don't know where you're going to live. We're all worried about the planet. Uncertainty is everywhere. For me, it was uh, lockdown that shut me down. I just found a place to rent with my two daughters, and I'd just got about used to being a single dad half the week. And then all of a sudden, I saw all of my income for the next 12 months turn to dust. But I knew that was the same as many others, so I tried to volunteer to see if I could help others whose livelihoods were crumbling. And in a space, I found stories that were humbling. I found stories of daily lived experience so profound that they put my fears into perspective. It is and has always been my belief that we lack the leadership we need for the future that we face. And with this new perspective in tow, I went out on a mission to try to uncover, to discover new inspiration and expertise in turning uncertainty into opportunity. And you know what? I found it. I found it in, in refugees who'd become CEOs. I found it in gang leaders who'd become business leaders. I found it in prisoners of war who'd become politicians and many, many more. I found clear and consistent patterns and behaviors that enabled these individuals to do what it is that we all needed to be done, but I knew that I needed more. I knew that I needed some kind of scientific explanation of what was going on behind the scenes to turn these stories into a toolkit that would help others too. And I believe that the interconnected challenges we face need interdisciplinary answers. So when Sam called me, I jumped. I assembled the best team, professors, cognitive scientists, even the empathy designer to the Finnish government, to see if we could use these stories to help others rewire their brains to face the unknown. And that is what we need, because we've got to remember the context. For the majority, the latter part of the 20th century was seen as this period of prosperity and stability. Humanity worshipped at the altar of productivity and predictability, not realizing that the cost for the illusion of certainty was to sacrifice the skill of innovation in uncertainty. And for scientific context, fundamental to our survival as a species has been our ability to adapt to the unknown. But our brains evolved to a world long gone and in the, well, the free fall of modern life, navigating uncertainty, well, it's an endangered skill. Research shows that the unknown is the fundamental human fear. But history shows that time and again it's uncertainty that unlocks us at our very creative best. So what is it that allows us to make this choice in the face of uncertainty between anxiety and creativity, between breakthrough and breakdown? Our uncertainty tolerance. Low will shut you down, high will light you up, quite literally. Low uncertainty tolerance is linked to anxiety, exhaustion, fatigue. High uncertainty tolerance is linked to collaboration and open-mindedness. Now, I know it feels like the last thing we need right now is another bloody intolerance, but <laughs> it was uncertainty tolerance that allowed Eden Basich to overcome the challenges of, becoming a, of being a refugee, to finding a job in a kitchen, to starting a restaurant empire. And it was uncertainty tolerance that allowed Nadia Finer to overcome crippling shyness and become a CEO and best-selling author. It was uncertainty tolerance that was the scientific explanation that I sought that sat behind all of these interviews that I was making. Now, uncertainty tolerance is a trans-diagnostic issue. All that really means is it connects and influences lots of things, but important things. It connects anxiety, it influences self-esteem, collaboration, innovation, resilience, empathy. It's like a superhero skill for the 21st century. But the important thing is to know it's malleable. We can all improve it. 
Now, we know that there are hordes of management consultants out there armed with three-point models to help us get through change, but perhaps no underlying knowledge of how human beings really do or really don't change. And here, in uncertainty tolerance, lies an answer. Because in individuals, a high tolerance for uncertainty allows a greater capacity to cope with enormous and ambiguous challenges like climate change. And in communities, high tolerance to uncertainty allows us to see past division and collaborate beyond cultural differences. And in organizations, and specifically in economies, the research shows we are more able to be innovative and regenerative. So this is what makes the difference. We just need to work out how to increase people's uncertainty tolerance. Now, stories are a powerful tool. So Sam started doing interviews, and I started trying to explain the science behind them. I mean, there was this added level of uncertainty because it was in a lockdown. We'd never even met in person. I mean, I never realized I'd be doing cutting-edge research by voice notes. Hi, Catherine. Another amazing interview. Rez Gardi voted a Young New Zealander of the Year after founding this incredible NGO helping young refugees around the world. But, and get this, she says as a result of growing up in a refugee camp in Pakistan herself, she developed this gut instinct she could completely rely on for whom she could trust. Now, can that be so accurate? And is it likely in her experience as a refugee that that, that gave her a heightened awareness? Yes, our body processes millions of bits of information that the brain misses, even beyond our main five senses. We use our internal emotions to guide us, that's gut instinct. With Rez's high exposure, I'm sure she developed an acute sense. Hi Catherine, okay, I think I get it, but how about this? Rez graduated from Harvard as a human rights lawyer, but even with now this huge intellect, she still relies on the gut instinct that she learned as a kid. Now she talks about bringing her brain and her body to difficult decisions. This seems like a balance that could really help people. Is this the psychobiological what's it that you were talking to me about? Um, do you mean embodied cognition? <laughs> I know, I know. Science has to get catchier names. But yes, exactly that. You can't accurately assess the unknown with facts alone. The best decisions in uncertainty come from information from both our brain and our body. Between what became endless voice notes, Catherine would bombard me with scientific research papers as I began to teach myself how to edit all of these interviews into the most exciting documentary I could. It would be stimulation. And then around these stories that I was editing, I'd capture clips from Catherine explaining the science and bookend the stories. And that would be information. And then once we had them together, I discovered a way to send prompts to the audience's phones that would challenge them to reflect on the stories and science they heard and contrast them with their own experiences. And then integration, because self-reflection is how we can reprogram our subconscious behavior and traits. The questions we ask people, reflection. Let's, let's do it now. Remember how Rez said that she taps into her body, she becomes aware, she uses her gut instinct to make decisions in uncertainty. Well, what does your intuition feel like? I'll give you a guide. Neither of you know much about Sam or me. But if you had to, using just gut instinct, who would you feel you trust more to keep a secret, Sam or me? <laughs> well, let's see, let's see, because this is a, this is a demonstration of the experiments as we've run them. We, we've touched on the, the scientific concept of embodied cognition. Rez has given her example of intuition, and now it's over to reflection. So can you feel it in your body, and what does it feel like? Is it in your gut telling you can trust me? Is it in your heart suggesting you should trust Catherine? Where in your body is it that you feel intuition, and what is it saying? Okay, okay, so to make it fair, hands up here who feels they trust Sam more. Thanks, thanks, thanks. So we good. can't put your own hand up. Okay, so hands Doesn't... up if you feel like you trust Catherine more. Ooh, I think once again you get a bit of a shocking... <laughs> Bad luck. <laughs> Every time. I don't know what's wrong with my face, but... It's intuition. <laughs> And actually, fair enough, because I'm terrible at keeping a secret. But, but you want to know that, and that's not the point. The point is, what did it feel like? It's about reflection. Rez says, after she makes a decision, she, she sits down and then she thinks. What did she feel? Was she right? Was she wrong? Um, was it bias that got in the way? This is how, over time, you master your intuition. 
And this is just a tiny example of the bigger experiment that we were running, right? Res is just one of the uncertainty experts that we spoke to. Intuition is just one of the skills that we teach. And embodied cognition is just one of the concepts that we touch on. We interviewed dozens more. We spoke to Morgan Godwin, who was sentenced to a 20-year prison sentence, but inside prison learned languages and law and emerged as a legal reform activist. And she told this incredible story about how in prison, to regulate her emotions, she learned to synthesize, to imagine the feeling of gratitude to calm her down. It's genius. She's refocusing her attention so that she can literally trigger a relaxation response and control her fear. But we also interviewed Carl Loco, who used to run gangs in South London and now runs social enterprises, but he still uses the techniques that he learned on the streets. And he told us about how he was able to embody the feeling of future regret to push him through his short-term fears. It's like cognitive restructuring. He's reframing how he's thinking about it to drive him towards uncertainty. That's something we can all learn. Science met stories, and suddenly we were creating this masterclass in uncertainty. Anything seemed possible. But, like all good stories... And all great science. Before every success, there is always a mess. What do you fear more? Things changing or things not changing? When change truly came knocking on my door, it didn't care about the potential of our new project, it didn't care about my desire to help others, it just barged its way in, and turned my entire life upside down and, and really left me on my knees. Which was ironic, because I've spent my whole life encouraging other people to embrace change. I went into science because I love humans, but I was disillusioned by science that got stuck in the labs and systems that bred silos. This was a chance to do things differently. And when Sam looked like he was going to break, I was heartbroken. And breaking point came pretty quickly. The last few years caught up with me. I'd left a social enterprise that I'd been running for almost 20 years. I'd recently got divorced with two wonderful daughters in tow. Hello, Scarlett. Hello, Frida. I'd started a new career that was exciting but incredibly anxiety-inducing as an author. And then global crisis after global crisis left me burnt out and nearly bankrupt. I was applying for insolvency the same week I started applying for my first ever job, and I can't tell you which one still scares me the most. Come on, Sam, you can't give up. You cannot give up now. Look, think about what have we learned. Think about the people we met. I mean, what did they say? Look in the rubble, because what grows there will be strong. You cannot give up. I really wanted to give up, and I really didn't want to give up. I'd wake up at 3 a.m. every night. All day long, my heart would beat in my chest. I couldn't focus for more than a few minutes at a time. I felt desperately alone, and I felt desperately unable to ask for help. And the fear of failing my daughters felt suffocating. I really didn't know what was going on, either in my brain or in my body. Uncertainty. Uncertainty affects your brain and your body. Uncertainty drives anxiety, overwhelm, burnout, as Sam had discovered. But don't you get it? The stories you have can help everyone turn this into a place of growth. Eventually, I got it, and I went back to the stories, and I took out a loan with some friends. And then that enabled me to take out a credit card. And then I took an online course about making online courses. And then I took the video from the different interviews that we've made and the science that Catherine had given me, and I began to house them in a space online where people could begin to interact with them. And as the project began to take hold, I made it real by creating 500 places that were available to buy to take place in this new experiment. And I assessed people's uncertainty tolerance before and after against a robust control group. I told Sam I felt very confident. In reality, I had no clue what would happen. And this is how we introduced the pilot of the experiment to the world. It's not that I don't feel fear. I most definitely feel fear with everything that I do. I was scared of being overwhelmed by the darkness, by the uncertainty. They put the gun against your head, and they pull the hammer back, and you can hear the mechanism creep. And, and if I can become a boxer, having never done it before, I think it shows that anybody can do things. You just have to build up to it gradually. For all of human humanity's history, the predictor of life outcomes has been our ability to deal with the unknown. 
and that means that you can create what you couldn't previously create because now you know more so you can do more you see more so you can be more hmm. applied research conference the findings suggest that the pilot program was successful in improving tolerance to uncertainty. We believe that this novel educational format, combining documentary style storytelling with interaction and introspection, can be successfully adapted to learning and behavioral change, providing an innovative solution to navigate the unprecedented complexity and uncertainty of the modern world. It worked. My school science teacher told me that my atoms would amount to nothing. So to lead international research that then became peer-reviewed and published, well, that was certainly uncertain. And then to be invited to the Royal Society, the most venerable and long-standing institution of scientific inquiry on Earth, well, as one of the professors there said to me, Sam, technically that makes you a scientist, but really, actually, that just makes me evidence of the transformative power of uncertainty. We did do it. The findings and all the evidence suggested that this was a new way to help people transform and increase their uncertainty tolerance, turning it into a driver for progress rather than the debilitating anxiety that uncertainty can bring. And we did it not just in the labs, but in the real world too. And this is just the start. This is an open and increasing and ongoing body of research, and the door is open to you all. So please join us because we all need better answers to uncertainty. In the UK alone, just one year ago, there were 11 million people living in poverty. There were 2 million veterans. There were 1.8 million single parents. There were 130,000 refugees. There were 24,000 children in gangs. There are many experts in uncertainty out there that we overlook and we misunderstand. And this is important because at exactly the same time, 60% of the UK cabinet came from two universities, and the entire cabinet represented five career pathways. These are obvious and uncomfortable statistics, but they lead to an obvious and uncomfortable place. If we continue to deny uncertainty, then we will continue to drive division and fear and limit our chance for real change. But if we can embrace and increase our uncertainty tolerance, a new outlook becomes visible and a new world becomes possible. So, what do you fear more? Things changing or things not changing? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Are you okay?